Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 12th episode of Range of Science. Today, our guest is Will Kinney, professor of physics at the University of Buffalo. Uh, he studies origin of universe, specifically uh, inflationary cosmology, and he recently wrote a book about it. Uh, called Infinity of Worlds. Uh, in my opinion, most popular uh, accounts of physics are either too popular and oversimplified or too technical. Uh, this book is uh, one of the exceptions. Uh, it is written uh, uh, for non-specialists, but it is not too oversimplified. Uh, thank you for coming, Will. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Uh, inflation, uh, roughly said, is a, a mechanism for realizing something called cosmological principle. And I would like to start with that to explain to our uh, viewers what is cosmological principle and uh, historically trace back how it was derived from uh, original Galilean Copernican uh, relativity and uh, how this idea led to the um, concept of inflation. That's, I, as you point out, I mean, this is an idea that has a very long and uh, a very interesting history associated with it. And it's, it's something that uh, has changed in characteristic over time, but has but kept sort of the essential nature of it. And it dates really does date back to, to Copernicus's original ideas. So that when Copernicus proposed a heliocentric cosmology, right? One in which the earth was revolving around the sun. In fact, the earth was moving, which was something that would be from the point of view of Aristotelian physics, a, a, a very problematic thing because Aristotle's idea was that motion was an absolute, right? That there was a, a, a universal frame of rest for all material bodies in the universe. And if you're going to have the earth moving, you, you have to get rid of that idea, right? You have to replace it with uh, with something else. And what Copernicus did was he replaced it with uh, a, an early form of the principle of relativity. So the, really the first person in uh, 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 the, this sort of uh, arc of scientific knowledge that proposed relativity as a fundamental concept was Copernicus. I mean, long before Galileo or, or, or Einstein, Copernicus and De Revolutionibus put forward a, a philosophical idea of relativity, the idea that motion was uh, a function of either the motion of the observer or the thing he was observing or both, right? Um, and this is closely related to this idea, which is, uh, you know, is, in we now refer to as the Copernican principle, the idea that the earth was not ordinary, that it was just one of many planets, right? And this principle has propagated through uh, cosmological thinking up until in the 20th century when people were first trying to apply Einstein's general theory of relativity to the cosmos as a whole, um, it was necessary to assume a symmetry principle, right? Some sort of simplifying idea that would allow you to solve the equations, uh, for want of a better way to put it. And I, Copernicus's idea of non-ordinariness, that the Earth was not in any special position in the universe, was extended to a larger concept of the idea that there is no there is no special place in the universe, right? So a, a universal application of Copernicus's principle to the, the cosmos as a whole. This led to the mathematical symmetry of homogeneity and isotropy, the idea that the universe is at least on average the same everywhere in all places, and also that the universe has no particular direction, right? There's no, there's no one direction in the sky that is favored over another. This principle then allows you to not only to solve uh, Einstein's equations for gravity and get the cosmological solutions that are now, of course, very well tested by data, but it also provides sort of a philosophical underpinning for how we approach modeling the universe as a whole, right? The, so the, uh, the cosmological principle, the idea that there is nothing special in any way about our position in the cosmos is one that has been extremely fruitful for several hundred years in terms of coming up with coherent structures for understanding the universe as a whole. It's been a very powerful concept and one that uh, uh, I think can be applied even beyond a, a, one of the things I argue in the book is that this principle is something that we would uh, be possible to apply even beyond the confines of our observable universe, but to larger scale structures outside that observable universe and in particular, ultimately to the inflationary multiverse which I'm sure we'll talk about. <laughs> um, uh, inflationary cosmology is known to have some very success, successful predictions, uh, 
but also there are some current challenges, flatness and uh, monopole problems. Uh, I would like to discuss that. So what are, first of all, some successful predictions and what are some uh, problems with the uh, theory? Okay, so the idea of inflationary cosmology is inflation is a theory for what sets the initial conditions of the Big Bang. Uh, what we mean by the Big Bang, sometimes there, there's, there are several meanings of the word, and it's important to disambiguate them. One thing that people mean by the Big Bang is the initial singularity, this point at 13.8 billion years from the past that the universe emerged from. Another use of the term is simply talking about the initial state of the universe as being very hot thermal equilibrium, very smooth and uniform at extremely early times. Um, inflation, in, in standard cosmology, these two things are essentially indistinguishable, so you don't have to care about the difference, but in inflation, it decouples those two things. So inflation takes place, if you like, before the Big Bang, in the sense that we mean the Big Bang as this hot, uniform, thermal equilibrium early universe. It replaces that initial singularity with a period of uh, exponentially quick expansion. So the universe during inflation, before the universe was hot, before it was dense, before uh, this uh, prim primeval fireball that we observe, for example, in the uh, light left over from that, this is called the cosmic microwave background. Before that, the universe actually would have been completely empty, cold at a temperature of absolute zero and filled with nothing but the energy of empty space, which drove this incredibly rapid period of expansion. That energy then later decayed to form, to heat the universe up and uh, fill it full of particles in, in thermal equilibrium. Um, and so the, the, this period of early exponential expansion sets the boundary condition for the hot thermal universe that followed. In so doing, it produces the sort of gross characteristics of the universe that we see, in particular that the universe is, the geometry of the universe is very close to being what's called spatially flat or Euclidean. In uh, solutions to the Einstein's equations for gravity, you can either have a universe that is positively curved, that is, it curves back on itself like the surface of a sphere in higher dimensions, or as negatively curved, which is this, these hyperbolic spaces. But the universe that we live in appears to be right on the boundary between those two, exactly at uh, neither po positively curved geometry or negatively curved, but exactly flat, so that uh, spatial surfaces in the universe obey Euclidean geometry. This is something that is not explained in the standard model of cosmology, but inflation provides a very natural explanation for why the universe should have this very fine-tuned, this very peculiar flat geometry that we observe it to have. Um, and you mentioned also the monopole problem, which was one of uh, Alan Goose, uh, the the uh, originator of the theory, one of his uh, main motivations in proposing inflation in the early 1980s was that theories of the time that unified all the fundamental forces, these so-called grand unified theories that unified the electromagnetic, the weak, and the strong nuclear forces, predicted that you would have copious production of what are called magnetic monopoles, a north magnetic pole without a south, for example that these things would be copiously produced in the early universe. And in order to get rid of these, Goose proposed this period of exponential expansion to dilute away all those magnetic monopoles that would be produced in grand unified theories. The monopole problem is not really considered that much of a problem anymore, uh, largely because uh, no, the grand unified theories have been failed to have been realized at least so far in particle physics. The, optimism in the 1980s that we, we were on the verge of understanding how to unify all these forces. Well, it, it didn't turn out to be so simple and we still have no well-accepted theory of grand unification. Uh, there are a lot of ideas, but nothing that is uh, uh, firmly established even now, you know, many, many years later. So we're not so much worried about monopole production in the early universe, but things like the geometric flatness of the universe and the smoothness and the homogeneity are things that are still unexplained in the standard cosmological model, and you need to add new physics in order to understand those. And inflation does that in a very neat and elegant way. Um, I would like to discuss um, one of the uh, assumptions of uh, the theory is that existence of uh, a scalar a kind of scalar field called inflaton field. Mm -hmm. uh, how, uh, is it possible uh, in the foreseeable future to um, verify uh, and how it's possible to verify 
existence, existence of uh, such field. Okay, the inflaton field, to give a sh short explanation of what it is when we're, we mean when we're talking about this, is it's a thing that's a lot like the field responsible for the Higgs boson in the standard model of particle physics, which maybe your listeners are somewhat familiar with. So the Higgs, the Higgs particle is an excitation of a field, and this field is a thing that permeates all of space, and it is this Higgs field that gives all the other particles in the standard model their mass. And it's a simple mechanism. Basically, the, the stronger the, inter, the the stronger the particle interacts with this field, the greater its inertia, the greater its resistance to acceleration, for example, and the, and uh, the, therefore the greater its mass. So the Higgs field is this. Uh, uh, it's called a scalar field, which is, you know, uh, uh, basically it, it acts like uh, a part of the vacuum. So it, in some ways, it's a little bit like the old concept of a, a luminiferous ether from the 19th century, this idea that you had to have some medium for electromagnetic waves to propagate through. The Higgs field acts like an ether in the sense that it fills, it uniformly fills space. The reason that we steal from this for inflation, the inflaton field, whatever is responsible for this accelerated expansion in the early universe, is something that's a lot like the Higgs in the sense that it permeates all of space and this thing can carry energy with it. So it acts like an energy density for empty space, which is what you need to create these conditions for this early stage of inflation in the universe. So it's something a lot like the Higgs field. Perhaps it's a different field. And in fact, in some theories of inflation, it actually is the Higgs field that's responsible for the uh, for inflation as well. So to, to get to your question, what are the prospects for actually directly detecting this is we really don't know. It's possible that this field is some hypothetical thing at extremely high energy, which would take very large particle accelerators to, uh, to detect uh, and is probably out of reach for the foreseeable future in terms of actually producing particle particles of this field. On the other hand, if uh, uh, if it is in fact, for example, like I mentioned, that in some theories it is the Higgs boson, and we've already detected it, and it's a it's a really interesting question, which is, is that suppose you actually produced particles associated with this field, this field responsible for inflation in an accelerator, how would you know that they were particles associated with that field? And it's not so obvious that it would be even possible to tell. Uh, so it may be we've already been producing them, and we just haven't correctly mm -hmm. identified them. Uh, so on the other hand, it may be that the, the prospects for producing them directly, for example, in, in, in the laboratory are pretty slim, right? And we have to rely on indirect evidence such as astrophysical. Um, so we don't know. Yeah. Um, one of the interesting, uh, one interesting argument I read in Julian Barbour's book is that uh, past hypothesis, which is assumed in cosmology, uh, um, uh, the generalization of second laws that universe entropy of the universe overall tends to increase was made in a historical era where we didn't know that universe is expanding. And so he claims that it is not uh, uh, and I would like to know how, uh, how sure are you uh, of uh, that, that past hypothesis is uh, true. What, that the second law of thermodynamics could be modified? In an it could universe, be or? that second law of thermodynamics wor works not just at uh, uh, regional level, local level, but at cosmological level. Yeah, that's a question with a lot of layers. Uh, certainly, so the idea of the second law of thermodynamics that things uh, uh, progress from order from order to disorder, or that, uh, uh, that that entropy increases uniformly with time, is something that certainly seems to be true in the universe we live in. I mean, empirically, it, it works. And the big mystery, of course, in cosmology is not why entropy is increasing, but why it was so low in the first place, right? So the entropy of the early universe, the level of disorder in the very early universe was extremely small, right? The universe was in thermal equilibrium. It was very smooth. It was, and, and in particular, the, the entropy associated with gravity, right? So that as structure forms, the entropy increases. So matter being concentrated into black holes is a, is a high entropy configuration. Matter spread out evenly is a low entropy configuration. So 
why is it that the matter was spread out evenly? Why was the uni early universe very, very low entropy? Observationally, we know that the universe has progressed from a state of low entropy to in the past to a state of high entropy today. So I don't think that there's any problem. Personally, I don't see any problem with expansion in terms of the second law of thermodynamics. But there is the mystery of why the universe started out in such a low level of entropy. And inflation partially answers that, which is that inflation erases entropy locally. Because if you take, basically, if you take a tiny patch of the universe, which has within it a relatively low entropy, and stretch that out to an enormous size, you can create very large spatial regions of the universe that themselves have, have very low entropy. So you can locally create that initial condition of low entropy that you need to explain a universe like ours with inflation. So inflation in that sense provides a partial explanation for why our universe started out in a low entropy state and is evolving to a high entropy one. If you think about it more carefully, however, you realize that it doesn't really answer the question because then you have to talk about what were the initial conditions for inflation. And in fact, inflation itself in order to get started requires a relatively low entropy state. So if you start to talk about uh, what set inflation itself off, what happened before inflation, you end up having at least as big a problem, if not a bigger one with entropy than you did with trying to explain the low entropy of the, uh, the, the thermal equilibrium Big Bang. So inflation, like I said, partially answers the question, but then opens up all sorts of new, even thornier questions that are that are much more difficult to answer. Um, some researchers, uh, physicists and uh, media outlets have uh, said that uh, James Webb's uh, space telescopes uh, observations uh, are breaking the standard model of cosmology. I have read the tweet by Sabine Hosenfelder that uh, uh, detection of early galaxies uh, is fits uh, bet, was predicted by uh, modified Newtonian uh, dynamics, but not by uh, lambda called uh, dark matter cosmology. But I have also read that uh, art articles that. Uh, mm, uh, standard model survived James Webb's uh, telescopes observations. What is your opinion on? Uh... I well, one thing is it's important to to point out that you see a lot you, with respect to this question. You've seen I've seen a lot of things in the media saying that oh, the James Webb Space Telescope disproves the Big Bang or something like that. Mm -hmm. Which that that is nonsense, right? So the basic idea of the Big Bang, this hot early state of the universe that expanded and cooled and, and uh, elements formed and so on, all of this story of the early universe that uh, that is contained in the Big Bang theory is perfectly fine. There's nothing about the Webb telescope observations that, had, that sheds any light on that whatsoever, right? So where were we? We were talking about the Webb telescope. And the idea is that Webb sees further out in space and therefore further back in time because light has a finite speed. The further out you look, the further back in time you see. So these objects that the telescope is observing at very high redshift, these galaxies that it's looking at at extremely large distances are galaxies as they were very, very long ago at very early times in the universe. And the surprise is that it seems to be seeing very well-formed, mature spiral galaxies, things like the Milky Way or the Andromeda galaxy, forming at extremely early times in the universe, earlier than you would expect in a standard model of cold dark matter cosmology, right? Um, so that is a problem for the standard structure formation in what's called the lambda CDM cosmology, a cosmological constant making up about 75% of the energy density of the universe and dark matter being the other 25%. Uh, because you would, in those kind of models, you expect structure to form clump into small pieces first and those small pieces merge together to form larger things. So the existence of these already well-formed large objects at very high redshift and therefore very early times is something that's difficult to explain. Uh, I don't know per se. I think the jury is still out on that as far as whether or not this is a, a, a fatal uh, observation for LCDM cosmology. 
uh, it certainly puts some pressure on it. There's a little bit of tension there. And I think that in a few years, within a, within a year or two, probably with, with uh, more observations, if we really start to see a large population of these galaxies, these well, there's going to be something we have to give probably. It's a, it's a challenge for LCDM cosmology to be sure. And if these observations hold up and if they continue to see galaxies forming a lot earlier than they expected, then it tells you that there's something that's not quite right with our current models and they'll have to be modified in some way. But I'm not sure whether or not MOND or some other less radical modification to the theory is going to be necessary. It's hard to tell at this point. Uh, what is eternal inflation and how it is related uh, to the inflationary cosmology? And uh, uh, so some uh, physicists uh, criticize the general uh, the different ideas of multiverse as uh, uh, metaphysical beyond the uh, scientific method. Uh, and what do you think about that? Too? Yeah, I spend, as you know, I spend quite a lot of time talking about this issue in Infinity of Worlds because it is it inevitably comes up when you talk about inflationary cosmology. The, the idea. A theory that realizes inflation in the early universe, something a theory that incorporates some analog of the Higgs field that creates vacuum energy that is dynamic and decays into the standard model that has all the properties that we need in order to explain how the universe today looks. What you inevitably find is that in such when you put together such a model, that inflation goes on forever. At least, and the only and inflation ends and creates these hot big bang universes like our own locally in little bubbles, but on a global scale, uh, it actually continues to uh, the universe continues to expand exponentially. Inflation creates new space at such a tremendous rate that even when uh, it ends and creates a, a bubble universe like our own, which is has hot thermal equilibrium, initial conditions, and so on that it's creating space in between those bubbles so fast that it basically, what you find is that inflation doesn't just create one universe like our own. It enters a steady state where it continually produces an infinite number of universes like our own. And so the analogy I use in the book is that the, the inflationary multiverse is like a glass of beer. And each of the bubbles that is being created in that glass of beer is a separate universe like our own. And in between, in, uh, in between those bubbles, the universe is expanding exponentially quickly, producing more and more space, producing more and more bubbles, and it just goes and it goes on forever. So the interesting fact is that when you write down a, a, a definite theory that realizes inflation in the early universe, what you find is that it ends up creating not just one universe, but an infinite number of them. And each of these universes are completely real. There's no way to inside our own bubble, inside our own universe, to see these other universes outside of our own. And this leads to the sort of the metaphysical questions that you referred to, which is that if you now have this prediction of a theory that is fundamentally untestable, right, you would have to violate base, very basic rules of causality in order, for, in order to tell whether or not these other universes are out there. Unless you got really lucky, it's, it's possible they might run into each other once in a great while. But there's no particular evidence that that has happened in our own uh, in our own bubble. So you end up with the uncomfortable problem of having a theory that makes a quite a wild prediction. I mean, quite a substantial one that is impossible to verify in any empirical way. And in this sense, you really hit a gray area, gray area marking the boundary between what's a fully scientific idea and what is you know sort of a, a primarily a philosophical idea. Um, this is where, for example, as I argue in the book, the application of the cosmological principle is helpful, right? If you take a Copernican viewpoint on this, that our universe, that you know, our position in the universe is in no sense ordinary, then it's not all that hard to believe that our universe itself is in no sense ordinary as well, that it can be just one of very, one of many universes as well. So we are one of many one of a number of planets orbiting around one of many stars and one of many galaxies, and each and those galaxies fill up a, a, a huge, potentially infinite universe. And in fact, if you take that logic even further, uh, our universe is perhaps only one of many other universes, and that uh, that is consistent with this Copernican idea. And I, I 
to my mind, that sort of rescues this in, in, in the philosophical sense where I'm not all that uncomfortable with it. Inflation is a theory that makes a lot of very definite predictions about uh, things that we can observe astrophysically and particularly the form of the primordial fluctuations that later collapse to form structure. Inflation makes a lot of really definite predictions about how the initial conditions for the universe should have been put together. We can actually go and test those. And so far it has passed with flying colors. All of the basic characteristics of the universe that you would expect if inflation happened turned out to be the way our universe really works. So we have this case of a, a, a predictive, well-posed physical theory that can be empirically tested. In fact, it has been empirically tested in a lot of ways. But if you then take this theory and calculate its consequences, it makes these unobservable predictions, this idea that uh, the, the, we are just one of many, many universes being continuously produced in this, in this uh, ongoing uh, uh, process of eternal inflation, those themselves are not testable. And at that point, you have to resort to principle, something like the, the, the cosmological principle in order, to, in order to comprehend it at all. Uh, traditionally, it is assumed that in the Bohr-Einstein debate, uh, Bohr was right and Einstein was wrong. But many physicists nowadays say uh, who have realist, uh, um, realist uh, philosophical position towards collapse of the wave function. And there are some who uh, are uh, uh, non-realists. Where do you stand in this uh, I, I guess I try not to take a side. I think that uh, uh, ultimately, the, I, I think there is some wisdom to the shut up and calculate school of quantum <laughs> mechanics, right? If you can't actually take your, you know, the, so there are many interpretations of what we mean by quantum mechanics and the wave function and so on, right? Uh, and unless that interpretation that you place on quantum mechanics, how you understand the collapse of the wave function has some sort of testable consequences, then you're, it's basically a philosophical position. And there, there, there's a lot of interest in this in foundations of quantum mechanics now, how we interpret the wave function and so on. I guess I see this is, I don't have too much of a philosophical problem with the idea that the universe has fundamentally non-deterministic properties right? That um, I think a lot of what we observe, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the fundamental, a lot of the problems that people have with, you know, the idea of something being in two states and then the wave function collapsing into definite states is answered by a process called decoherence, where any quantum mechanical system is not really, is not isolated, but it's going to be interacting very much with an environment. And those environmental interactions take something that is essentially a quantum mechanical system and tends to, through a process of decoherence, turn it into a, a classical system. And this quantum to classical transition then is something that happens as it's not a sudden thing, but it's a continuous thing. There's a, there's a continuum of, of, of states in between fully quantum and fully classical that can be explained by a decoherence. Many people will point out correctly that this doesn't answer the basic question of what happens with wave function collapse. And that's true, but it mitigates the problem because it means that real physical systems are typically ones that are, where you don't have to worry about this unless you create very special isolated conditions. So we can explain our ordinary experience pretty well for all intents and purposes by just saying that essentially these the quantum mechanical systems tend to interact uh, strongly with their environments. Uh, that having been said, you, you still have to, if you want to take this viewpoint, you have to also accept the idea that there, are, uh, uh, that quantum mechanics is fundamentally a causal, that there's a, that there's a probabilistic aspect to fundamental physics, that you have a system that, uh, like the decay of an, uh, like, a, a, if I have a spin in a superposition state, which, which of those states I'll observe, is really randomly determined. And I think this is what a lot of people don't like about this, people who propose hidden variable theories and so on. They wanna have some sort of clockwork mechanism underlying the quantum mechanics that makes it so that everything is completely well-determined. I have a set of boundary conditions. I have differential equations that send me that, that evolve me into the future. 
and this deterministic picture of the universe that goes all the way back to Rene Descartes and so on is something that physicists are really loath to give up on for a variety of pretty good reasons, for example, unitarity and so on. But I think ultimately my guess is we probably will have to give up on the idea that the universe can be explained by a deterministic hidden variable theory, even a non-local one. I, I think a far more elegant explanation is that in fact, the universe is not deterministic at, at, a fund, at some fundamental level, that there is fundamental randomness. And I think that's where quantum mechanics is pointing us. So I don't know whether that makes me a realist or a non-realist, or uh, I, 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 I don't follow those philosophical camps too closely because uh, I, I think that there's a lot of labeling that goes on that uh, hides a lot of subtlety in terms of uh, the kind of- I agree with that. that. Um, that is because I liked your formulation of uh, uh, law of physics as a chain of cause and uh, uh, effect uh, described by uh, differential equations. See, there is a lot of debate uh, between humans and anti-humans on what is the physical law in itself. Is it independent of the uh, processes or, but uh, at uh, basic level, yeah, it is uh, cause and effect described in the uh, form of differential equations. I like the definition. Yeah, well, this is uh, I, I, in the in the book. I quote Alan Turing on this, who, who in a letter to a friend wrote that uh, uh, science is a differential equation and religion is a boundary condition. <laughs> <laughs> and I think actually quantum mechanics tends to undermine that. I think that what quantum mechanics tells you is that uh, we do not have a set of different, you know, uh, of deterministic differential equations governing the evolution of the universe, that there are not, there are fundamentally non-deterministic, non-deterministic aspects to it. And that to me is very profound. And I, I find myself, I, I'm often frustrated by physicists discomfort with that as a solution to the problem, if you see what I mean. Uh, uh. Uh, I I had a discussion discussion with my friend who is doing a master's degree on black holes, uh, uh, Luca Lomtatiz, and he asked me an interesting question, and I would like to ask it uh, to you. So, uh, falling into a black hole, uh, when someone is falling to a black hole, it is assumed that it uh, object slows down and red shifts until it completely stops at event horizon. Uh, frozen from outside point of view. And his question is, does this imply that uh, surface of the black hole in some sense stores uh, visual information about the object? It, uh, object to, so it's also... There is certainly a, a, a good deal of debate about that question in quantum gravity communities, mm -hmm. right? So if you really are trying to use black holes as these test beds for how you might quantize gravity. There, for example, are all these ideas of firewalls that, where, in fact, the, the, this idea that the immediate interior of the black hole horizon is this point is this uh, point at which information gets either destroyed or stored, depending on how you view it, right? Um, certainly from a classical standpoint, so the, 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 this is one of the things that's really difficult to comprehend about black hole physics is that from, if you are on the outside looking at an observer, looking at somebody falling into a black hole, their clock, the clock of the infalling person slows down as they get closer and closer to the event horizon and eventually stops. And, and classically it takes uh, them an infinite amount of time to fall into the black hole. From the point of view of someone who's sitting outside, but the point is that from the point of view of the person falling into the black hole, if you now ride along in the rocket with them, they will actually fall through the horizon and end up at the center of the black hole as in a finite amount of time as measured by their watch. Mm -hmm. So it's this peculiar thing where one observer sees something, a process take an infinite amount of time, but another observer sees that same process take a finite amount of time. So classically, we, we resolve it by just saying that the observer at infinity is seeing essentially an illusion. That the real thing that's happening is, if you follow along in the reference frame of the infalling observer, there's no problem. They fall. They, in fact, they don't. They notice almost nothing when they fall through the event horizon. One of the peculiar properties of black holes is that the density of the black hole gets, drops as the thing gets bigger. This is 
uh, contrary to our experience with material objects, right? So if I build up a planet out of rock, essentially the density of the thing is proportional to its volume, right? So, the, uh, uh, or it might be a little bit more dense because gravity is going to compress it, right? So you, you might think, think the bigger planets are going to be denser because they're compressed more by gravity. Black holes are the opposite. If I define the density to be the mass of the black hole divided by its volume, which is the only reasonable way I can think of to define it, right? then black holes get less and less and less dense as they get bigger and bigger until you get to the point where like a 10 billion solar mass black hole has a density about the same as the density of the air in the room. So an observer falling into a supermassive black hole, it's for example, at the center of a galaxy, we know these 10 billion solar mass black holes exist, right? They are at the center of uh, uh, some very large galaxies. We've, we've detected ones that are that big that falling across the event horizon of such a thing would be a very gentle process because mm -hmm. even the, like the density of the black hole is only about as dense as air. It's, it's nothing, right? A lot denser than interstellar space, but still, you know, uh, essentially you would, you would see very little. It would be a very gentle transition. You wouldn't feel a lot of tidal forces. You wouldn't feel a lot of stretching or anything. You would just pass inside the black hole and not even know it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't think that, strictly from a classical standpoint, there's no problem with this paradox of time dilation when you understand it correctly. Um, but from a quantum mechanical standpoint, that uh, all bets are off, and that becomes a much more complicated problem, uh, which is related to questions of black hole entropy and whether or not black... So it basically, nobody understands how to... Uh, meld gravity and quantum mechanics in such a way that they explain these thermodynamic properties of black holes adequately. And there's a lot of ideas on how to do that, but there's still a lot of debate about it as well. And it's certainly not my specialty as a researcher, but uh, I do follow it with interest. But I don't know the answer any better than anybody else does, unfortunately. <laughs> um, in the end, I would like to know your opinion on, on... What are the dangers of science uh, going ideological, popular science going ideological? Recent uh, examples of scientific American nature behavior, uh, writing uh, somewhat politically biased uh, uh, papers, one I'd say. So um, do you think that ideology and science could be should be kept completely uh, separate? I think, I mean, Scientific American for, is, a, is a nice example of what happens uh, when you allow uh, a, a scientific institution to become deeply politicized, right? In that they have taken to publishing a lot of just like extremely uh, just nonsense, highly political, politicized articles tenuously related to science but not really in, in fact about science at all and you pay a price for that i guess right w with any decision like that one of the things that makes science as an institution useful in societies in my, my opinion is that it maintains a, an ethic at least of objectivity i mean human beings are not objective creatures right uh, that no nobody's viewpoint is purely objective. It's 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 an it's an ideal rather than it's a, it's an unattainable ideal, but it's still valuable to have it there as an ideal, because if you take that away, that that sort of a little bit of distance and trying to actually figure out what the truth is, right? So science is something that has traditionally uh, concerned itself with questions that can be answered in some objective way, right? The, the, the fundamental assumption of scientific uh, investigation is that there's an external reality out there that has certain properties and it's, and it's possible to find out what some of those things are, right? And to determine what's true and what's not about the outside, the, the world that exists objectively uh, without us, right? Independently of us. If you no longer believe that's true, if you think that everything is uh, it, it, that all knowledge is subjective, that there's no objective comparison to some standard outside of yourself that can be done, then you lose essentially the rationale and the power for scientific investigation. And I think one should be very cautious in doing that. 
because it has, you know, science has proven to be incredibly powerful in terms of its ability to transform human societies. I mean, you, if you look at what technology has done for mankind in the last 500 years, I think one would be hard pressed to say that it was a, a, a that it was a bad thing, right? I mean, human beings are materially vastly better off than they were 500 or 1,000 years ago in aggregate. Uh, and it's true of almost every human being on the planet. Most people are better off than they were uh, 1,000 years ago. And if you, and, and, and that is due in large part to this change that happened with the invention of modern science where we uh, looked to nature as an objective arbiter for what's true and what isn't the, the idea of scientific empiricism and if you get rid of that you're killing the goose that laid the golden egg to a certain degree that you lose the power you can't you can't, you can't uh, get you can't eschew that fundamental characteristic of the way you look at scientific investigation and keep its benefits uh so I I find it uh, I find it very disconcerting to see a lot of scientists themselves advocating for essentially naked politicization of the scientific process because I think that that will remove the ability not not only will it destroy the credibility of science politically there's that immediate political problem which is one reason that people have been willing to quote unquote listen to the science is a perception that the scientists are being objective and that they're not pushing a particular political agenda one way or another. And if you and if you remove that, you will destroy people's faith in the process. Mm -hmm. But there's more to it than that, which is you'll destroy the process itself. Once you politicize scientific investigation, once you quit caring about what's actually true and what isn't true, mm -hmm. then you are no longer doing science at all. And you will not you will not produce the kind of results you'll not you'll not actually arrive at any kind of understanding of the truth that's necessary in order to progress technologically and socially to the to the next level beyond what, where we are now to solve global warming for example you have to care about what's true if you're going to solve global warming right because nature doesn't care <laughs> The, the the response of the planet is a mechanical process that is the uh, that uh, is is indifferent to any political viewpoint we might place on it. And so if we want to actually save the planet, if we want to solve global warming, if we want to uh, uh, preserve our environment, we really have to care about what's true and what isn't. And we have to we have to have some sort of objective method of determining that. That's just one example of many that of why this is important. So for me, I uh, I really wish that we could take science and retain it as something that is uh, nonpartisan and above and beyond any particular political battles that we have at the time, because we need it. We need an institution like that that is nonpartisan, that's concerned with fact and fiction, uh, that can inform our decisions in a, in a concrete way. I think it's tremendously important socially.